Good evening. Thanks for tuning in to our webinar today. My name is Jeff McKay from BrightSquid. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the business of improving patient outcomes, specifically looking at e-consults and e-referrals. With me today is Dr. Mark Lewis uh, from, from Calio Health. Uh, Dr. Lewis, how are you? I'm very well, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Good. Thanks for joining us. We do have um, uh, Dr. Wayman, who will be joining us shortly um, to, to help with questions. And we've got a couple of prepared presentations that we'll be going through in terms of the, the physician experience of e-consults. But um, let's take a look quickly at what we're going to talk about. So we're going to, we're going to define e-consults for you so you understand what they are, how they fit into your practice. Uh, we'll talk about CPSA uh, standards of practice and guidelines for referral management and how e-consults can support that. Um, we'll talk about um, applicable health service codes for reimbursement um, for e-consults. Um, so those do exist here in Alberta. Um, and then we'll talk about how e-consults and e-referrals work on the EMD uh, consults platform. And, and um, Dr. Lewis, you're, you're involved in that, so you'll be great to help take us through all that stuff. And then we're going to hear from, from a couple of specialists who are using e-consults in their practice um, to, to improve patient outcomes. So we'll hear from uh, Dr. Wayman and Dr. Campbell as well. Uh, so let's jump in. So um, what is an e-consultation uh, from a definition? It's an electronic um, communication between the primary care uh, physician and specialist uh, regarding patient care. Um, it's typically meant to be asynchronous, meaning there's no need to align schedules as you would on a phone consult or an in-person meetup. Um, and it's done in a way that is compliant um, with uh, privacy regulations. Dr. Lewis, any, anything you want to talk to you about that there? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the, the e-consult process has been around for a number of years now, and uh, we've been using e-consults at Calio Health uh, along with uh, some of the technology from BrightSquid since 2015, and we're now seeing with, as, as technology evolves, the concept of e-consultation is evolving as well. And currently in Alberta, it is a, an insured service to have e-consultations between a primary care physician and a specialist or a primary care physician and another primary care physician that has more knowledge in that particular field. So today we we're, we're really wanna expand on the process of e-consultation and allow the viewers to understand how they can actually use the platforms to advance their practice and increase their access to specialists. Great. Yeah. So how, you know, what e-cons do in a, in a big way is accelerate patient care. So do you want to talk about that? I mean, Calio has a lot of experience. You've got a lot of experience in, in the whole EMD platform uh, is built around this concept. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the reasons why we've explored e-consults is because of the the true issue with a su supply and demand. There's a mismatch of supply and demand in specialty care. This is based on a limited supply of specialists available to provide the care that is needed in the community by patients and primary care physicians. So e-consults allows us to extend the utilization and accessibility specialist by using technology and innovation. We now see that specialist advice can be brought to a primary care physician without the need of referral. Physicians can use the technology to ask a question of a specialist and the specialist can respond using a safe technology and allow their patients to get specialist advice, to be able to mold the treatment plan and the care pathways utilizing that advice in a very timely manner. So we're in the normal process of things that could take months or years to make a referral and get advice from a specialist. Now using innovation technology and the e-consult platforms, a specialist can provide advice within hours or within days. Can you talk a little bit about meeting the standards? Yeah, absolutely. So the CPSA has put out some guidelines for referral management and most physicians and clinics are aware of these guidelines. Most specialists are aware of these guidelines. And these guidelines are really set around ensuring that there's clear communication for the referring physician 
and for the patient. So currently the guidelines stipulate, as you see on the screen, that a referring physician should have a response on the referral, that referral was received within seven days. They should get a response within 14 days if the referral is accepted or declined. And then after that period of time, if the appointment can't be done within a, a timely manner, the referred physician should receive some communications every three months until the patient can have that in-person consultation. The difficulty with these guidelines is that there wasn't any means, any modalities to help the specialists actually meet these guidelines. In, in order to meet these guidelines, it does take quite a bit of time, effort, efficiency, and manpower. And most uh, specialists are currently oversubscribed with the number of referrals that they're having. So therefore their staff are oversubscribed with the workload and it's very difficult for them to respond and meet these college guidelines. We've looked at this process and said, how can we create efficiencies for both the referring physician and the specialist and allow them to meet these guidelines? And innovation was a tool that we kept coming back to. We now, with using the e-referral, e-consult platforms can respond and meet these guidelines in a much more efficient way. So when a referral received or an e-consult request is received, there's an immediate response, not only to the referring phys physician, but also to the patient. We do this through a secure communication means by utilizing the BrightSquid secure platform. So all communications are secure. We can provide additional details and information regarding the, the condition and some results that we wouldn't be able to do in a standard communication platform. So utilizing the BrightSquid platform, we can send notifications back to the physician with, within hours of receiving a referral or, or request, and we can send them back within days of accepting or declining that referral or request. And if the patient has been accepted and they're waiting for appointment, we can use automation to have touch points with the patient, deliver questionnaires, gather more information, and those touch points will be ongoing until the patient actually has their visit with the specialists if required. Right. So in that, and then in that sense, I mean, what's interesting about e-consult is, is, you know, it's not just sending out a fax referral. Um, so there's, there's billing codes um, to support this on, on both sides of the equation. Um, the referring physician um, upon completion of an e-consultation um, can bill. So the code for that is 0301R and the consulting physician, uh, 03010. So, um, you know, there's there's good reason to do this a little bit beyond um, the fact that, you know, it's, it is good for, for patient care. It helps meet the guidelines. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the results that, that clinics see when they start implementing this process. Is there anything you wanted to add to, to the compensation side of things on that, Dr. Lewis? Yeah, you know, as we can see that Alberta Health Services and Alberta Health and Wellness has provided these billing codes to encourage physicians and specialists to use e-consultations e as a means to support in their patients. They, they really wanted to hit home and therefore they've allowed even the requesting physicians to bill for that instance because they know that there's preparatory work in place to deliver the information to the specialist. And the specialist has to review that information and respond in a timely manner. So they're, they're compensated for that as well. The, the, the thought of providing fee schedules for these is really to encourage the utilization of these services that will allow for a decrease in wait times and allow for an increase in response times. Not only is Alberta Health and Wellness supporting e-consultations, but as of October 2018, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada endorsed the use of e-consultations between physicians and specialists as a standard of practice in Canada. So it is supported not only in Alberta, but right across Canada. Not all provinces have a fee code for this service, but Alberta has, is well um, underway in encouraging the use of these services by providing these fee codes. 
Yeah, and I, you know, I'll say it's interesting you talk about you know the reason for doing this. You and I were talking earlier today about um, lean healthcare, right? And you know, we, uh, talking about you know the the, the eight waste and you're digging into that stuff, right? And um, delays in time is a big part of that. And so e consults really help answer that. And we'll look at some of the statistics here um, so we can understand. But first, um, we want to go through uh, the EMD process so that um, we can see how quick and easy it can be to submit an e consult and respond to an e consult. Uh, if you want to walk us through this process, I'll, uh, I'll drive the slides here and you can explain what we're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Before I go through all the details of the process, I just want to let everyone know that the EMD platform that is um, working with collaboration with Calio Health and BrightSquid was developed to provide an efficient platform to request advice and also deliver that advice. So this piece of technology allows for asynchronous communication between a primary care physician and a specialist. And what that really means is that you, we don't have to wait for someone to be on the other end to ask for advice. You can ask for that advice and then that specialist can deliver that advice at their convenience. Right now, we're able to deliver that response within a seven day period, but for urgent matters, we can deliver that response within a few hours. And that allows the, the specialist to be able to work uninterrupted and it also allows a primary care physician to do the same. So the system is really built to really augment on the efficiencies of e-consultations, both from the providers for the primary care side and the specialist side. So what you see in front of you right now is the a template of how we gather the patient information. We input this in the system. This system is highly secured and built on the backbone of the Bright Squid Secure Mail process. And so all patient information is held at you know, the highest level of security. We can input the data on behalf of the primary care physician, or we can provide the primary care clinic access to the platform where they can actually input the information and also include the clinical information, demographic information, any relevant documentation for the specialist review. We have a several specialists that are working with us right now, and including Dr. Wayman, who, who should be speaking later today, but we have headache specialists, internal medicine specialists, MSK and pain specialists, comprehensive orthopedic specialists, and rheumatologists that we're currently working with. So this is a short list of specialties right now but the, the plan is to grow this specialty list over time so that primary care physicians have access to a large variety of specialists to make the request. Patient information is, is input into the system. It's, it's put through a radius vetting of that information to make sure we have everything that we need before it is submitted to the specialist for a review. Okay. This is the area where this primary care physician would, would ask their specific question of the specialist. So we obviously need um, demographic information of the patient, um, health card information. Uh, we also need ways to communicate with that patient. Um, if we can get email addresses for the patient, we can then invite them to join the secure mail network. So that way we can continue gathering more details in a secure manner. But the most important piece of all this is the e-consultation question. It is meant to be a non-urgent question. Obviously, we want urgent indications to be sent to the proper channels, a referral to the emergency room or, or through the rapid system. But non-urgent matters, the physicians can type in their questions and attach any documents that are relevant to the care and case, and then that is submitted onto the specialist. And, and so let's talk a little bit about what the specialist sees here. So once this information is passed on the specialist, they can view all the information that was provided. So they'll see the question at hand, they'll get some demographic information for the patient, and they will get a list of all the relevant information. This is important because when we have phone calls with a specialist from an advice perspective, 
it is all verbal. There's very little documentation that's provided. So it's, it, there's not a lot of a, an audit trail to determine what was provided to the specialist and then what was provided back as an answer to the primary care physician. So phone call e-consults are widely used right now, but as we innovate these processes, we find better ways to make it more efficient. Documentation is very important in healthcare. We don't want to make any mistakes by not having the relevant, relevant information or trying to discern the information through a phone call and mismanage that information. So when it's well documented, all the details are there to be reviewed and there is an audit trail of the information that's provided and sent back. So this is a first step in gathering the details of the patient information and relevant questions. Right, and, and so, um, sorry, here we go. And that's, so, and it's all results now in um, a report that's generated. So take us through the report, how it's generated and what information is included in here. A absolutely. So. The specialist will review all the information and provide recommendations back to the specialist or back to the primary care physician to help them manage the care of that patient within their clinic, or it may result into an ongoing e-referral. So after the review of all the relevant information, the specialist will provide some feedback on the documentation. First, to ensure that the documentation is relevant to the question and to ensure that we have some diagnostic information to help with assessing the needs of the patient. And through that information, the specialist will provide a preliminary diagnosis and a clinical impression. Those, that information is transcribed back onto the document that is sent forward and back to the primary care physician. As we go to the next page, you know, some of the the biggest pieces to this conversation is the recommendation and plan. So if there's a question in regards to how to manage this patient, you'll find the details of the answers in the recommendation and plan, but the rest of the details earlier in the body of the report just confirms that we have all the detail, that we are answering the question in a relevant matter, and then we jump right into uh, rehabilitation and uh, non-medical conservative care. We will add some details on that. And then from a medical plan, we'll provide some details of the plan the physician can carry out or what the next steps may be. And the next steps may be that the patient requires an in-person consult. The next steps also may be that more information is required. So the specialist can have a, a back and forth communication with a primary care physician to ensure that we have all the, the relevant information in place and to ensure that we all understand what the next steps are. This is clearly documented in a report and then this report is transmitted back to the primary care physician through secure mail channels. Right, and I was just going to really reiterate that. That's, that's a great point too. You know, all of this communication happens through um, the secure email system that's, that's private um, through, through Redskin and through EMD. Um, and one of the important guidelines or criteria for those, those health service codes we were looking at for reimbursement um, is that all communication takes place through one system just like this. So, you know, it, it can't be like, you know, one EMR system sending to an email address and then the, the communication coming back through a fax machine or something like that. Is, is that is that right? That, that's absolutely correct. So. The, the standard of practice dictates that a secure communication channel is used to send the information both to the specialist and also disseminate that, that uh, report back to the primary care clinic. And so utilizing secure mail, we've been able to move information back and forth very smoothly. But to add to that, even though other e-consult platforms have secure communication, usually what they're lacking is the ability to engage the patient securely. The very nice thing about this BrightSquid network is that BrightSquid Secure Mail is available to all Albertan, all patients free of charge. They can access and, and sign up for BrightSquid when they sign up for My Health, Alberta My Health portal. Mm -hmm. And so patients can be kept in a loop. There's no additional cost to the patients to have a secure mail address. And there's no cost for us to engage with the patients to, to 
ask questions from them, gather more data. This data is very relevant and we know patients wanna be part of the process. So we designed this to be a closed loop system. So all stakeholders are involved. Notifications are sent to the requesting physician and to the patient and the specialist gets notifications from anytime an e-consult request is made and anytime an e-consult request is completed. So all stakeholders are engaged in the process. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I think, you know, when you look at something like this, um, including patients in these conversations has all kinds of benefits, you know, from, from the clinician point of view, and we'll, we'll hear you know, some of Dr. Campbell's comments on that in, in knowing that the job is complete and done you know, from the from the staff point of view, and that they don't have a patient calling them every couple hours saying what's going on with my referral. Um, you know, or you know, on both sides of, of both clinics there. You know, and I know you know you at Cali, you've had a lot of success in including patients on um, on consult requests and referrals, and going direct to the patient with follow up questions instead of waiting to go through that channel of going back through the the, the referring clinic, which takes additional time. Um, so, so it, it really works well in that way. Absolutely. There's lots of efficiencies that are made from um, going through the e-consult process itself. And those notifications that go back to the patient and the referring uh, clinic really reduces a lot of friction points. Um, prior to us utilizing e-consults and e-referrals, we'd get many phone calls from the clinics. Hey, did you receive that referral? We get many phone calls from the patients. Hey, did you receive that referral? Now that we have ability to, to have a timely response to these clinics and patients, those phone calls have pretty much been eliminated. The clinics now yeah. can operate efficiently. The patients can be very comfortable that the process has started for them. And along the way, we continue to engage them because we know there could be long wait times. And so we understand that patients always want to know that they're not waited in vain that they have yes. some reason to wait, they're waiting in the right line, and that something is happening for them, even though they may not have an in-person appointment right away, the process has begun. And that's great too, you know, here, so we talk, we look here about, you know, conversion to an e-referral. So, you know, it, it, it's great to sort of, it helps filter out those cases that really do need to be seen versus those that don't. And and you know, the question comes up, how do I know if this is a referral or an e-consult? Well, you know, the great thing is you can let the specialist make that call. Um, and, and they can, through the process in EMD, um, they can decide, like, like you can see right here, we're going to turn this into a referral because this, I, I need to lay hands on this patient and, and do further investigation. So um, that's what's great about this process is you end up having, um, you know, a tiered solution, a tiered system where you can filter patients that really need to be seen and get them seen and patients that don't need to be seen, you can get them answers more quickly. Uh, absolutely. The advent of e-consults was just step number one. The e-consults mm -hmm. really assist in ensuring that appropriate referrals are advanced in an appropriate timeline. So the EMD platform takes an e-consult and convert it into an e-referral when necessary but also it could prevent unnecessary um, referrals altogether by providing um, advice and providing um, care pathways that the primary, primary care physician can then continue with and no referrals actually required. The concept of e-consults and e-referrals is not new. The, there, there are many companies and many processes in place the number one in Canada is the Champlain-based e-consults. They were established back in about 2010. In 2020, they tested a point of concept in Kitchener-Waterloo. Referrals from 10 specialists were, were triaged utilizing e-consults. In the United States, the San Francisco General Hospital launched a program where all their referrals would go through an e-consult process. The results of utilizing e-consults to manage referrals demonstrated a 20 to 40% decrease in in-person specialist visits. So this was this is a 20 to 40% of patients who are no longer in the queue that, that allows the patients that need to be in that queue to advance more quickly. It also showed that 90% 
it, it also showed a 90% decrease in wait times for non-urgent visits. If we can get patients through the queue or out of the queue, we can see that we can really decrease wait times. And wait times have become a growing issue right across Canada. The, the Fraser Institute reported that in 2020, the average wait time across Canada was 22.6 weeks for an in-person visit with a specialist. In Alberta, that wait times were even higher, 29.4 weeks for in-person specialist visits. And we can see 20 to 40% of those visits were, or, or referrals were unnecessary, either inappropriate or not ready for that referral at the time. So the e-consult, e-referral visits utilizes specialist reviewers that reviews all that information to determine first, is it appropriate for that specialist or specialty? And is it ready for that specialist or specialty, even if it is appropriate? Sometimes we need more diagnostic information, so more clinical information. So the specialist reviewer can formulate and provide some decision-making tools for the primary care physician. Yeah, and then you know, speaking of that, we we have you know we can get some urgency in, in here as well. And you know, we, it's interesting we talk about the statistics. Sometimes we think about scarcity in, in specialties, and oftentimes it does turn out to be a bit of a false scarcity. And it, and there's there's a bit of too much extra process built around these things. Um, and e consult in this way help us get around that, so we can actually get get through to the root of the problem more quickly. Absolutely. The specialist reviewer can definitely determine urgency. And you know, I know a lot of times in a community, we have some community physicians that will mark a referral urgent simply for the fact of getting that referral moving forward. The criteria for urgencies are very different from specialist to specialist. And, and when we can interject a special reviewer into the process, they can help refine what that true urgency is. Therefore, we get back to the concept of the right person to the right place at the right time. The e-consult, e-referral, specialist reviewer, all these components are very integral into ensuring that we can have this process working properly for everyone. There is truly a, a mismatch in the number of referrals versus the resources available. At this time, we're not able to increase the resources, the number of specialists available. Therefore, we wanna make sure that their time is well spent and that they're exactly. they are as efficient as possible. Yeah, and, and in that case, you know, setting urgency, um, you know, like you 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 said, um, we can we can help better sort of schedule those appointments, right? So the people that really need to get seen can get seen, and and um, we're not dealing with the first come first serve basis. Absolutely. Um, so here's here's a quick we'll we'll look at this, and then I want to get into to our our discussions with um with Dr. Campbell and Dr. Wayman, but. Um, these are these are available right now through um, through EMD and Calio Health. Um, you know, there's a couple of rheumatology, psychiatry coming soon, um, functional regenerative medicine, wellness, and personal performance. So there's there's a lot of options here, and a lot of things that you can be looking to um, to get extra support in them um, in access to that knowledge. Um, so, Absolutely. And, and we we will be sending this out so we can um, you can review those as well. And if you have any questions, just we'll give you an email address at the end. Um, to uh, to reach out to if you have more questions, but uh, in that realm, um, we will get to our recordings right now from, from Dr. Campbell, and Dr. Wayman. I want to point out in your go to webinar control panel on the left of your screen, um, or the right of your screen, sorry, um, there's a question box. So as we're going through these, if, if questions occur to you, we do have Dr. Wayman on the line. Um, if any questions pop up, certainly um, certainly type them in there. We'll get to as many as we can. So let me just uh, we'll launch here with Dr. Campbell. Um, and uh, it's about 10 minutes, and he's going to go through his experience and his thoughts on the process. Dr. Campbell, thanks for joining us today and and and, uh, and sharing your experience with us. But if you could just take a minute to introduce yourself and and talk about some of your experiences and thoughts around e-consult. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm from South Africa. I've been working as a physician in Canada for about almost 25 years now. Um, this is my 40th year in practice. I'm focused mainly on chronic pain now, although I've mostly done family physician work, occupational medicine, and disability medicine as well. Can you tell us about your experience with e-consultation? Right. Um, at the beginning of 2019, I was offered a job doing chronic pain assessments, which is now my main focus. 
And that got me more involved in the virtual world. Remember, this is obviously pre-COVID. Now, for the last few months, I have been using BrightSquid. Um, although I live on Vancouver Island, it allows me to work travel-free in Alberta. The type of work I do on this platform is by far mostly chronic pain consults involving spinal pain. And I find that the ease of flow, the amount of detail available by merely checking the boxes, and this with a few text additions, makes it user-friendly and extremely easy to recommend. I think what I like best is that when I complete, uh, complete my chronic pain virtual consults, I feel like my work is not only well done, but done, period. Um, with my other categories of work, there's often issues and uh, little niggly points I have to follow up on, check on, and so forth. Uh, you know, things that occupy a lot of airtime in one's head, which one would rather cross off one's list. So I have the security that the work is well completed in a highly usable form, in my opinion, and that this helps my workflow as well as that of the referring physician. Um, and we we do have a sense that what is good for the treating physicians is probably also good for the patients, especially in this period of extended wait times. My opinion is that post-COVID, virtual medical care delivery is going to remain important. Obviously, platforms such as BrightSquid also give physicians more expansive work options. And when used on a larger scale, I suspect, they may significantly help with physician burnout by providing ease of use, cutting down on unnecessary travel, as well as what I can perhaps best describe as less cumbersome uh, communication. Having peace of mind and confidence that actionable medical direction is being provided efficiently, securely, and timelessly also obviously goes a long way in that direction. And I simply suggest that physicians try it out for virtual care. Um, you know, really appreciate your perspectives on this and, you know, how this serves the greater community, really. You know, because it, yeah. it is yeah. a bit, it, it's about connection of information, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, it is. And, you know, physician burnout now, which for the last two years has been almost 60%. And that is not during COVID times, right? So what do you see as the biggest benefit? Uh, of e-consults to, to the realm of primary care? There are quite a few, actually. The obvious benefits are efficiency and reach. You know, the program reaching into the remote areas and physician, uh, patients being able to reach specialists, both for patients and physicians. Some patients we know are also too old or too frail at any particular time to travel when they could be safely seen virtually. Then there's the reality of Canadian winters and the vast distances. Also important now is that it is finally possible for the family physician to move forward with the patient by asking a question that can be dealt with by a specialist right away, rather than sending the patient the old way through the hospital acute care system and all that that entails. That's causing a lot of physician anxiety. You've got somebody that you really need more um, direction to act on or to treat, and yet there's not a lot happening. You yeah. mentioned that you believe e-consults done, done in this way that, that you're doing them are good for patient outcomes. Can you expand on that part as well? Sure, I can give you my opinions. I do believe that completely. Our wait times in Canada have been pretty extended for a long time now. Now, when we look at workflow, we tend to focus on ways of getting the work done. But then there's also this other important, less mentioned issue that is going on that involves patients living for extended periods in a state of anxiety, worry, perhaps with sleep dysregulation, all of which collectively are somewhat pathogenic. So it's not just about client satisfaction, but also client well-being. Although virtual care is a significant change from what we are used to, the patient would at least have the feeling, and rightly so, that they are being dealt with in good time and that things are happening and progressing getting physicians answers for their patients is you know just seems to be a bit of a load off physicians as well you you don't have that extra anxiety it helps everybody move forward more quickly i i my in my own level i used to keep what's called a problem list patients i needed to check on 
and uh, I kept it a hard copy and they didn't go off the list until they were dealt with to my satisfaction. And the minute that list gets too long, then life becomes you know, uncomfortable. So I, I, I get a lot of satisfaction knowing that things are being dealt with or at least improved. I know you're you're seeing really one side of it. You have insight into the, the other side in the, in the family clinics. Can, right. can you just explain a little bit of the process of e-consultation and, and including a bit about what makes a, a complete request? Well, the, my understanding of the referral process is that it's fairly straightforward. As to referral problems, from my own perspective, I do receive a few that have really too little information, a very small number, and I mean minuscule. I've had to decline based on inadequate information. Then there's also the over-inclusive referral package. This makes it difficult for the specialist to review in a reasonable time. What sometimes happens is one delegates the task to someone frontline who's maybe less trained and to be safe, they say more. I don't feel comfortable till I actually read every document. So I can see the date, but I still, is there something in there? And, and so in that sense, I mean, we've kind of talked around this a little bit, but do, do you see e-consults as detrimental or, or, or supportive of traditional practice? No, I see it as actually very supportive, especially in the context I mentioned, but in general as well, because I believe that if we were to remove or curtail the service that we have now, post the COVID session, I could say, or, or period, there would be patient resistance, at least to a degree. What we usually see is we all have this normalcy bias to stick with what we already know and with what is the pro proven way. And I think that's also safe in many aspects. But I've sometimes wondered to myself whether in the early days of the telephone existence, some physicians initially might have felt it inappropriate or even it might have been very uncomfortable for them conducting any of their professional work by phone. That having been said, there's no substitute for the physical examination when necessary or appropriate. And this is very important, and I have to say it. A diagnosis can certainly be made virtually, but it's sometimes way more of a challenge, or often I would say way more of a challenge to specifically rule out important, serious differential diagnoses, as we well know. So it's an important point. You know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody advocating for an end to a physical presence in, in healthcare and medicine. But it's, it's also just as important to, to point out that, you know, certain conditions, certain diagnoses can be made this way and to be aware of the limits of each and, and you know, make sure that your process yeah. goes appropriately. You know, as a clinician, I mean, the judgment is saved the day. If there's that feeling that I know if I were in a position where I thought something solves me, I should see this patient. I just had that feel. That's probably the leak of multiple experiences over years telling you, let's just be sure on this one. And then, so one final question, how do you see the use of e-consult supporting the sustainability of healthcare in Alberta? I think it's particularly good for Alberta, as I mentioned before, with a harsh climate, land mass, aging population, and there is the benefit of cost reduction it offers in the current, I would say, strained global financial situation. And it's conceivable that cost could be reduced by office sharing between a greater number of physicians with the virtual care part done from, I guess, anywhere. You know, so instead of having five physicians sharing a suite of rooms, you could have 10, but then being devoted elsewhere to virtual work. So from my perspective, the question is not so much about the choice between what we have now or reverting to what was. For me, it's more of a question of whether we will be able to implement and grow it in a reliable and durable way. Now, personally, I'm quite optimistic about it. There you go. Thanks for that perspective from Dr. Campbell. Now let's uh, check in and uh, listen to Dr. Timothy Wayman's perspective on e-consults. Uh, Dr. Wayman, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for giving us your time to talk about e-consults. Uh, welcome. Sure. And um, uh, I was just hoping you could just do, do a brief introduction about some of your background and, and, uh, and what brought you to, uh, to the realm of e-consults. So I'm a UK-trained um, family medicine doctor and a sports medicine uh, 
primary care physician. Um, I came to Canada about 11 years ago now. And prior to that, I was uh, in professional sport with a premiership soccer team and the um, England rugby set up. So second team and under 20 level. Um, I've worked at the Glen Saver in Edmonton since being in Canada, and I currently work at the University of Calgary Sports Medicine Center. Um, prior to coming out to Canada, I set up an interface service between primary and secondary care for uh, triage and treatment of non-surgical orthopedic problems, uh, including spine. I realized that the interface between primary and secondary care, it's really a, a knowledge gap. And what that used to result in is obviously referring the patient to secondary care to see a specialist. And a lot of these patients don't need to see a surgical specialist because they don't need surgery. They just need more uh, conservative medical management of their problems. So I got increasingly interested in how to provide healthcare for patients that was more patient-centric, more accessible for patients uh, in, a, in a quicker turnaround rather than being waiting on a, an outpatient waiting list to go and see a specialist that they may or may not need to see. Uh, whereas where, what they really needed is somebody just to look at their file and their data and give the primary care doctor some guidance about how they might manage the patient's problem in primary care without necessitating them going into the hospital. And uh, I regularly do electronic consults for uh, primary care practitioners in Calgary, giving them advice about managing spinal problems and uh, non-operative musculoskeletal problems in their patients. So if we look at it from different uh, perspectives, if you look at it from the primary care uh, doctor's point of view, um, EMD have made it very, very simple for a primary care doctor to, to submit an electronic request for a consultation. The traditional way of writing a referral letter, dictating it up and printing it off and signing it and sending it to the specialist who may or may not look at it for a considerable period of time, uh, you take all that out of the equation. Um, so it's a much quicker turnaround. Um, the primary care doctors are still asking the same questions of the specialist. It's just that it happens in a much quicker um, way. So from a patient's point of view, instead of sitting on a specialist's inbox for however long it takes for them to look at the referral and however long it takes to get the patient into the clinic, uh, you know, they can turn that around in, in 48, 72 hours and, and send uh, a treatment plan recommendation back to the primary care doctor to enable the primary care doctor to continue to manage the patient conservatively in primary care. Uh, and it's a lot quicker. It's a lot quicker. Um, uh, how long does it take you to review? If you're reviewing a, an e-consult, what's the average time it would take you to go through that? So the EMD system is very simple to use. Um, all of the supporting documentation that gets submitted by the primary care doctor is put into the dashboard. You open up the patient's file. Uh, you read all of the documentation. There is a link to Netcare where you can look at the relevant images. And then once you've done that startup work in terms of developing templates for common problems, um, it takes very little time. It probably takes less than 10 minutes. A big shift, even even less than it would maybe just to sit down with the patient. Exactly, yeah. You know, when, when I was at medical school, I was told it takes two minutes to say hello. Um, <laughs> so you don't have to say hello to the patient because you just got the information there in front of you. All, all of the um, issues in terms of patients turning up in outpatients without necessarily having the right uh, investigations, having all the information presented to the specialist at that time to enable the specialist to make a clinical decision about what's the next appropriate treatment for that patient. Um, you filter all that out by doing it this way because I can send a report back to the family doctor and say, well, you should really do an MRI because this patient's got particular arm or leg pain and they need an MRI for us to make clinical decisions. You know, if they didn't go through that process, the patient would wait to go to an outpatient department the specialist would then say you need an MRI. The patient then has to wait to get an MRI, which just delays the treatment even longer. So doing it this way, you, you can make sure that when the patient does ultimately need to be seen in secondary care because they've exhausted conservative management options in primary care, they have all the relevant um, investigations and they've been through all the relevant processes and they've trialed conservative treatments that have failed 
and therefore they become more appropriate to be seen in secondary care because that's their next step in their treatment pathway. So my, my experience in the UK is that if you manage patients conservatively, um, and depending on what discipline you look at, 85% of patients who go into general orthopedic outpatients don't need to be there to see a surgeon because they're not going to have an operation as their definitive treatment. So you can weed all those out before they see the specialist. And what tends to happen is that ultimately the patients who then do end up seeing the specialist because it's appropriate for them to do so, or they've exhausted conservative management, what we call a conversion rate in terms of how many of those patients that the surgeon sees in outpatients ends up on an operating list goes up dramatically. So my experience is in general orthopedic outpatient department, it went from 15% conversion rate to 85%. And in spinal uh, consultations, it went from 5% to 95%. And, you know, from a patient's point of view, potentially their primary care doctor gets guidance from a specialist how to manage their condition without the patient even having to go to the hospital. So, I mean, sustainability for the entire system is better now because we're seeing patients more efficiently. Is that, exactly. That's kind of what you're getting at, yeah. How do you see e-consoles like this supporting greater access to care and, and improved patient outcomes? I think it's already been proven that um, it, it provides a greater care. I think it depends on the specialty. Um, I think information-based or image-based Specialties like maybe dermatology, hematology, endocrinology, that sort of thing, uh, where the patients are going into secondary care to see a specialist uh, because their primary care practitioner feels that they need advice on how to manage the patient's problems. And in old fashioned um, uh, way of delivering that care, it meant the patient had to go to a hospital outpatient department several months potentially down the road whilst they're still suffering from a problem to see uh, a secondary care practitioner to move them on to the next stage of their um, delivery of care. I, I think it's got tremendous potential. Um, you know, it's been around and people have been talking about it for at least a decade, if not longer. Um, from a consumer's point of view, if you want to call a patient a consumer, there's massive advantages to not having to wait several months to get basically uh, an opinion about what to do next to manage their condition. So I think from from patient perspective, it's huge. I think uh, from a cost-effective point of view, it's massive. For simple closed-loop medical problems, it's it's very much an attractive option. Uh, There's some private players in the marketplace who provide that sort of interaction with the patient so they can book a, a virtual consult on their smartphone or their laptop and have a, a booked consultation with a primary care practitioner for $20, $25 and patients find that very palatable in terms of when they take into account the overall cost in terms of time and travel and everything else. Something like 35 to 45% of all primary care consultations between a doctor and a patient is information exchange. So if we look at different ways of providing that, it has massive benefits from a patient's point of view. I personally feel it has benefits from a doctor's point of view. It's a much, much more cost-effective way of providing healthcare in a lot of clinical circumstances. You talked about um, continuity of care, and you talked about some of the other private options. Um, can, yeah. can you talk about how introducing e-consults into practice can help with help alleviate some of those threats? Um, I think a lot, a lot of doctors need to be a little bit more business savvy than maybe they are. We've been operating in an environment where we've had an oligopoly and we don't necessarily need to be quite as receptive to our customers' needs because there's far more patients than there are doctors. Any business has to address what their customers' primary needs are uh, and, and, and meet them and deliver them. And if they don't, then you know they're, they're not going to compete very well in the marketplace. Patients, for sure, want uh, to access care in this way. I think if we don't embrace it through the state-funded system, then a lot of it will go into the private sector. We need to evolve and uh, and, and look at different ways of providing, non-traditional uh, ways of providing healthcare for patients, because patients will want it and demand it, and if we don't provide it, they'll go somewhere else. Simple, simple economics, as far as I'm concerned. Well, well Dr. Wayman, thank you so much for your time. I, that, that was very, very, very helpful. So we're back. There you go. That's Dr. Wayman's comments. Um, we do have a few questions I want to get to. You know, the big question, we kind of talked about this. How do you decide 
between an e-consult and a referral? Like, how do you, what's the difference there? How do you know um, what you should be dealing with? An e-consult is really more of a specific question that uh, the physician needs further advice with. And typically, it is something very straightforward and it can be answered fairly quickly and efficiently and does not require the patient to be seen in person with the specialist. Uh, obviously, the, the referral is our traditional way of connecting patients and specialists, and it is quite uh, tedious because there's many friction points that go along with the referral. The obvious one is the preparation of the referral, the wait times, and the responses during those wait times. Those create many friction points, not only for the referring physician, but also for the patient. The concept of e-consults versus e-referrals is actually something we're trying to eliminate. We don't want them to be seen as two separate things, but we want them to be seen as a whole. So if you believe a patient may need to see a specialist, or you have a question in regards to that or a condition, we suggest making an e-consult request. And if everything can be fulfilled within the e-consult alone, that specialist will provide all the details there. If further consultation is required, the specialist reviewer can forward that e-consult and remit that to a specialist as an e-referral. Again, the e-referral aspect of it is, is trackable. There's notifications. So if it is moved from the e-consult world into the e-referral world, the referring physician is notified and the patient is notified. This is the only system in Alberta that provides that process that will take an e-consult and turn it in, into an e-referral if necessary, or can capture an e-referral and stop it before it becomes a true referral because an e-consult can fulfill the needs. So it does really um, lend itself to the best of both worlds. Then in that sense, you know, we, we talk about, we talked about, you know, the, the specialist available for e-consult through EMD right now. What conditions in there and outside of there uh, or presentations fit are fit for e-consult? Currently, um, our spinal roster looks at all spinal conditions. Our internal medicine uh, physicians will look at all internal medicine conditions, hyper hypertension, diabetes, obesity, hyperlipidemia, uh, things of that nature. Sometimes it's, it's more around helping the physician to create a care plan or to ensure that all the appropriate tests have been done to confirm a diagnosis or medication management. So there's a lot that goes into this outside of the entire referral process. Mostly it is just managing of the patient so the patient doesn't have to travel to a specialist. There does not have to be any delays in the care for that patient. And so the, the process allows the healthcare system to be more efficient overall. Our, our orthopedic surgeons will do some general orthopedic reviews. Um, you know, one, one recent review that we had was of a teenager that there was a question about um, some pain and functional issues. And the orthopedic surgeon was actually able to pick up an early osteosarcoma. And this was done from an e-consult perspective. There was no in-person visit, but the appropriate diagnostic information was provided, the appropriate clinical information was provided, and the orthopedic surgeon was able to pick up this osteosarcoma and provide some urgent advice back to the family physician on what the next steps need to be. So there is huge merit from many different disciplines for the, the advent of the e-consult. The Champagne-based um, e-consultation platform and process out of Ontario has done over 50 peer-reviewed articles demonstrating that e-consults, e-referral models can be effective in improving access to specialty care especially in underserved areas, but it could be right here in the major cities where wait times are still a concern. Yeah, yeah, right. And I mean, you know, think about that, the case in, the, in the, the teenager, you know, having to wait the average of eight to nine months, um, 
you know, part of part of the great thing about e-consoles is you have less development of complications, uh, or you know, things are not getting so far down the road um, that that extra treatment is required. Uh, and and so in that, one of the questions is, what do you see as turnaround times? And so, you know, we've heard that it takes it can take 10 minutes to to complete an e-consult on a on the specialist side, but what do you see on the on the platform in terms of a turnaround time from when a question is submitted um, to to when advice is provided? So right now, the standard of practice set forth by Alberta Health is um, a no longer than thirty days to respond to an e consult request. We always strive to be better. So right now, we track our turnaround time for all our special specialists, and our current turnaround time is seven days. So from the time we receive the request to the time the requester receives the report back to them, we're working on right now on a seven day schedule. And that is for routine. If it's an urgent matter and it's indicated as urgent, then we can turn around that in a much faster time frame. If we talk about the guidelines, we talk about how we meet them, what other tools are available um, to support meeting the CPSA guidelines around referrals? Well, other tools that we have or other tools out there right now? Well, I, I mean, I don't know. This is just a question that came in. So, I mean, I guess both. Ah. <laughs> and I realize that we're a little bit outside of, the, of your scope, but, but you know, yeah, I mean, I know you, you, you pay a lot of attention to this realm. A absolutely. We've actually had um, other clinics, uh, large specialty clinics like ours, contact us in frustration when these guidelines first came out because there was no other means to actually meet in, meet in these guidelines without increasing their manpower, increasing their cost. And it is quite labor intensive to get all these communication pieces out there. So, you know, some clinics have put in some innovation within their facilities to help meet these college guidelines. I, I do know that referred physicians, when they send referrals to us now, you know, they, they highlight these guidelines in regards to touch and base with the, the patient and send in these um, requirements back out in a timely manner. But I can tell you without innovation or without increased costs, it is very difficult to meet these guidelines. But with the utilization of the innovations we put forward, it actually has become very easy to meet these guidelines. And, and so in that sense too, so talking about the adoption process, You've you've done a lot of work in in taking Calio to sort of more of an e-consult process, and I know that a lot of the clinics you work with were were quick to adopt that, but I know not all of them were. So, what do you what advice do you give for people who want to start to implement these processes in their clinics? You know, the, the number one advice is to be honest with you, get your clinic on Secure Mail, get your clinic on Brightspit Secure Mail. It's gonna allow you to become more efficient to communicate with clinics like ours. Instead of faxing referrals over to us, you can get on secure mail and you can secure mail that document over to us as an e-consult request or as a referral. And we will put it through the proper channels. Uh, we will do an e-consult on the information provided, be able to send notifications back if you provide the patient's email address, we will invite them to secure mail if they're not on secure mail. Therefore, by them being on secure mail, they will be engaged in a process immediately. So they will get notifications about the process. Uh, obviously they do not get the consult report back to them, but it does go back to the family physician so they can engage with the patient bring them back into their facilities for first consultation. It's, it's good healthcare, it's good business, and it's utilizing technology to its best um, benefit. Right now, we are probably one of the only industries utilizing the fax machine. The end of the fax is coming soon. We've encouraged clinics from 2015 to participate in secure communication channels so that we can move information more effectively and efficiently we can confirm the movement of that information. There's audit trails that allows us to, uh, at one click, to confirm if it's been received. And so it really removes the concepts of more and more friction and error points. The lean concept is to remove waste. Using a fax machine and call in and understanding if a referral is received, those are all antiquated ways of doing things because they add waste. 
we want to reduce waste time and we want to reduce waste and you know joining bright switch secure mail allows us to function more efficiently that's a good point right i think um we end up a lot of time stuck in processes and the fax machine is a great example um that have been in use for decades um and it becomes habit uh, that um that we're, we're unaware of either some of the issues around it or we're just unable to to discover and implement new ways of doing things that, that give it the same sort of functionality so finally i've uh, got sound <laughs> we got sound welcome welcome dr wayman yeah 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 Thank you. Sorry, Thank you guys. That's okay. Um, Dr. Raymond, I think you know for you, I'm, I'm really interested in your thoughts around implementation and how clinics can adapt to to getting things done this way. Um, I don't think it's a big transformation for them, to be honest. And most um, primary care doctors now have electronic medical records. My understanding from Mark and um, Kevin is that they introduce smart forms that pretty much extract the information out of the EMR that's required and package it so that the doctor uh, is no more difficult for them than it would be for them to fax off um, a more traditional typed up or dictated referral. In fact, it's probably easier, I think, because they don't have to um, tag all the relevant documentation onto the referral letter. I think the smart form does that for them. Is that right, Mark? That's correct. Yeah, the, we've implemented some <coughs> smart forms in some of the EMRs, not all. Um, there's a big transition in EMRs going on right now, especially for TELUS um, EMRs. Our, our, our short to medium term goals are to have more integration to the EMRs, but right now it's, you know, you can send it via um, fax and we'll digitize it for you. You can send it through BrightSquid or you can use the smart forms um, and we we can definitely connect with all clinics to discuss smart forms. Yeah, and so and I, we talked a little bit about it in our in our discussion earlier, Dr. Raymond. But um, can you talk about how what this means for you, like having this this um, this method of working with patients in primary care um, in a consultant in this way? How does that impact you as a, as a clinician um, in in your ability to have greater impact? Um, I think one of the big big things for me seeing patients in secondary care is it can be extremely frustrating for the patient and therefore for the, the specialist when a patient has waited so long to come and see you and then you have to simply tell them, well, either you don't need to be here to see me, you just need to do this or we need to send you here or they haven't got the appropriate investigations. You know, patients, I mean, in my disciplines, they're usually in pain. Um, and they've waited a long time and they're expecting you as the grand poobah to sort the problem out on the spot sort of thing. Um, and then if you tell them, well, in actual fact, you need something doing that is another delay, it just it just ups the ante with them. Um, so you, you can navigate all those bumps in the road out for the patient before they actually come to a face-to-face -face consult. I, I find it very easy to use the platform um, I've been doing them for quite some time now with uh, Mark and Kevin, and uh, as I said in the interview there, uh, Jeff, you know, a lot of it is just really um, uh, a more experienced level of knowledge or familiarity with the clinical scenario, uh, processing the information that's already readily available to the family practitioner, and just feeding back that the family practitioner can try X, Y, and Z options from a treatment point of view that doesn't necessitate them, necessitate them seeing a, a specialist at that time um, and they've always got the get out clause if you like at the end that if all the conservative management options fail they can still send the patient back again i think from a specialist point of view currently it's a process that they're having to go through to triage the referrals anyway to see whether they're appropriate or not and as mark said that takes a lot of manpower it takes a lot of resources it takes a lot of a lot of the specialist time Currently, that time is not remunerated. The specialists don't get remunerated until the patient's actually in front of them face to face. So this is a way of doing everything that they do with the old fashioned paper triage uh, in a quicker manner, in a cleaner manner, that creates a record that's not necessarily paper based or ring folder based. Um, and it covers the cost of, of providing that sort of um, you know, input from a time commitment point of view. So I think everybody wins. I can't see any downside to it at all. Um, I think 
it will ultimately catch on. Um, and I think more and more people will embrace it. And I think in time it will become almost an expectation and that's the way we'll process large numbers of um, requests for uh, consults or, 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 you know, requests for outpatient appointments. Great. I mean, it, it does, we, we've seen, um, you know, this, the traffic alone of, of e-consults coming to secure mail and bright grid um, with EMD has, has been um, more surprising. Maybe maybe not Dr. Lewis, maybe not to you, <laughs> but it certainly was to me to, to see you know, how many hundreds of messages are going um, back and forth. Uh, thousands even you know um to, to to implement this process so it's been really good um, yeah sorry one comment uh jeff i also do some specialist yeah. link uh, telephone conversations <clears throat> and it's frustrating on both ends because you know for one conversation you may be having three four five attempts to actually connect on the telephone um whereas if you do it this way around you haven't got a doctor on one end of the line being waiting around for the specialist to ring them out. You've got the specialist trying to get hold of the primary care doctor. Uh, so, from a time efficiency point of view, that that's a bonus as well. That's yeah, a very good no, point. yeah, that's a great point. And yeah, and in that, I was actually going to add to you know, the issues of documentation. And the phone consult brings up you know a good point, right? I think what's one of the things that you'll see when when we get Dr. Campbell's interview working is he talks about um, you know getting. Um, the right documentation and having too little versus too much and um, yeah. e EMD does a good job of making sure that the right information is there and to, to make the job easy for both sides um, so that you know you as a specialist have enough to go on um, but not too much so that you're spending extra time um, you sort of digging through the weeds as it were. Exactly yeah. Absolutely. Great well in that in that realm any other final comments um, you know, I think one other question, Dr. Wayne, we might have for you is, you know, how, how would you recommend people decide, like, is, is there a gate for you in terms of what, what should just be sent as a referral versus an e-consult first, or, or do you think doing an e-consult initially makes sense across the board? Yeah, I think, you know, if the primary practitioner is not sure, uh, then sending it as an e-consult, and as the develops, you know, if the specialist determines that it needs to be seen by a different specialist or it does need a face-to-face -face outpatient appointment then that can be automated into the system uh, potentially even to the point where you send the referral to the person who actually contacts the patient to make an appointment it's, it's just no it's just another um work stream isn't it um so if the primary care doctor is not sure whether it's an e-consult whether it's a referral for a face-to-face -face consult then they don't need to make that assessment. They don't need to make that decision. Just send it to the specialist anyway, and they'll make that decision for you. They'll make the call. Great, perfect. Well, well, thank you both so much for your time. Um, hopefully it was valuable. I think we had a lot of great discussion and, and really interesting points. Um, like I said, we will be sending out the recording. Thanks again, have a great evening uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of your week.